Greetings, and thank you for joining us for the CHCI session on racial equity and social justice in America, building on 2020's momentum. My name is Ron Estrada, and I am the Senior Vice President and Head of Government Relations and Corporate Social Responsibility for Univision. I also serve as the Vice Chair of the CHCI Board of Directors. And on behalf of CHCI, I would like to thank the National Education Association, Planned Parenthood Federation of America, T-Mobile, Quicken Loans, and Univision Communications for their generous support of this session. Now, I don't have to tell you that we are in both an illuminating and decisive moment right now on racial equity and social justice in our nation. While the pandemic has laid bare nearly all the structural and racial inequities we face in our nation, the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and too many others, it has also laid bare the racial injustices people of color face every day in this country. Now, these clearly are not new problems, but this unique intersection of a pandemic, a recession, and the largest ongoing protest movement in our nation's history presents an entirely new moment that we must figure out how to take full advantage of. That is why I am honored to be associated with this panel discussion today so we can explore deeply how we combat systemic racism and forge a multiracial, multi-ethnic solidarity around solutions that create a just world for everyone. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce our panel hosts, the Honorable Joaquin Jeffries, our sponsor speaker, Joanna diaz Soffer from T-Mobile, and my friend and colleague, our moderator, Siki Felix from Univision. Representative Joaquin Jeffries represents New York's 8th Congressional District, an area which encompasses large parts of Brooklyn and sections of Queens. Representative Jeffries is a tireless advocate for social and economic justice. He has worked hard to help residents impacted by the devastation of the COVID-19 pandemic, reform our criminal justice system, improve the economy for everyday Americans, and protect our health care. He is chairman of the House Democratic Caucus. In that capacity, he is the fifth highest ranking Democrat in the House of Representatives. And on June 25th this year, the House passed H.R. 7120, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Representative helped lead the charge with respect to passage of this historic police reform bill, which included legislation authored by the congressman to criminalize the chokehold and other inherently dangerous tactics, such as knee to the neck. Representative Jeffries remains dedicated to working with his colleagues to make transformational police reform a reality and breathe life into the principle of liberty and justice for all. It is also my privilege to welcome Joanna diaz Soffer, representing one of our plenary sponsors, T-Mobile USA, who will also provide welcome remarks. Joanna is Senior Manager, Strategic Alliances and External Affairs at T-Mobile. This panel will bring together representatives from the corporate and national nonprofit sectors to discuss racial equity and social justice in America. To moderate this important and timely session, we are delighted to have multiple award-winning journalists and international speaker, Siki Felix, news anchor for Univision Washington Newscast. Siki from Michoacan, Mexico, carries strong roots in her name, which means flower in Purapecha, a strong pre-Columbian civilization that continues to thrive today. She moved to the U.S. at the age of 15 when she gave her first formal radio presentation on Radio Éxito in Reno, Nevada. Since then, she has immersed herself in community betterment, mentoring, and directing youth and women's groups to strive for self and social goals. Siki has twice been speaker for TED Talks on subjects such as immigration and freedom of the press. She has anchored Noticiero Univision and Espeta America newscast, and her work has been recognized with multiple Emmy Awards for investigative series. Twice she has won the coveted TV News Emmy for Outstanding Achievements by a News Anchor, among many of her many honors throughout her career. I hope you enjoy the session, and don't forget to continue the conversation on social media. Hashtag CHCIHHM20. And now, without further ado, Congressman Jeffries. I'm Hakeem Jeffries, Chair of the House Democratic Caucus, and I want to thank the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute for this important conversation. 
as we grapple with the question of racial and social justice in the United States of America. The House Democratic Caucus now is the most diverse legislative caucus in the history of the Republic. And as a result of our diversity, there are now more African Americans serving in Congress than ever before. More women, more Asian Americans, two Native American women, more members of the LGBTQ community, and more Latinos serving in Congress than ever before. We recognize our diversity is a strength, and we have come a long way in America, but we still have a long way to go. And racism has been in the soil of this country for 401 years. And the journey, of course, has been a turbulent one. From slavery to Jim Crow, Jim Crow to mass incarceration, mass incarceration to xenophobia coming from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. We still have a long way to go, but we can get there working in partnership and coalition to build a better America. In America, with liberty and justice for all. In America, with equal protection under the law. In America, where every single person, regardless of race, regardless of gender, regardless of sexual orientation, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of zip code, or immigration status has an opportunity to participate in the American dream as a citizen or a dreamer. So God bless you. God bless the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute. God bless the United States of America. Have a wonderful panel discussion. Hola, amigos y colegas. Agradezco la oportunidad de dirigirme a ustedes. Mi nombre es Joanna diaz Sofer. Thank you for this opportunity to address the 2020 Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute's Leadership Conference and introduce this timely discussion on racial equity and social justice in America. 2020 has been a painful year for millions of Americans. A global health pandemic has hit and laid bare the profound vulnerabilities and inequities in black and brown communities. There is mounting despair, frustration, and anger over racial injustices and unnecessary tragedies occurring in our country day after day. But there is hope for change, and all of us as individuals and as a part of companies and organizations have to challenge ourselves to do more. That includes T-Mobile. In March, we launched T-Mobile Connect, a plan designed to help the most vulnerable among us get and stay connected. For many Hispanics, a smartphone is their only connection to the internet. And as our nation moves to the next generation of wireless service, 5G, T-Mobile believes the benefits of this technology belongs to all of us. T-Mobile stands with the movement to end racial injustice. It's part of our company's DNA to connect people so they can realize their greatest potential. And we're proud to have partnered with six prominent civil rights organizations, including National Urban League, Unidos, and LULAC, on a historic diversity commitment focused on building a pathway to corporate success for underrepresented communities. We have committed $25 million in diversity initiatives, including investments in underrepresented communities to support tech entrepreneurship, bridge the gap through digital literacy and job training. Still, we all know that change starts at home. And I'm proud to tell you that T-Mobile is restructuring our talent development programs and increasing retention for diverse employees to strengthen our talent pipeline right up to the executive level. We're also committed to Project 10 Million, a multi-billion dollar commitment aimed at eradicating the homework gap for millions of students by providing free service and hotspots to 10 million households over five years. The commitments we have made to ourselves, to our employees, to our customers, and to all our partners, including CHCI, are not just words. We're here because we're ready to do the work. Our voice, nuestra voz, es nuestro poder. Gracias por tu tiempo. Hi everyone, my name is Titiki Felix. I wanna thank uh, the host today for CHCI presentation. I'm a news anchor for New in Washington and I also host the national show Politica Ya on Univision and Entrevision. It is a pleasure again to be part of this panel. I was uh, yesterday involved in different panels that have to do a lot with what we're going through 
day to day. And as a journalist, I cover a wide range of subjects that are constantly uh, putting us on edge when it comes to our lives and our integrity. And I'm including myself as a Latina, as a woman, as an immigrant, and someone that is witnessing day to day everything that is going on within our community with the mission and the responsibility to inform about it and to make sure that we get the answers that we all need. I'd like to thank Ronald Estrada. He's a senior vice president and head of government relations and corporate social responsibility for Univision. Gracias, Ronald. I'd also like to thank uh, Representative Hakeem Jeffries and Joanna Diaz-Softer from Government and External Affairs for T-Mobile, our sponsor. Thank you so much. Now, I'd also like to thank uh, all of you for joining us and to be ready for a great discussion because we got experts to talk about the subject today at hand. And it's just not any subject. Uh, this is definitely a pandemic that is bringing a lot of struggles for everyone, economical, education, um, unemployment, uh, even fear about uh, the, the mental issues that we're all facing when it comes to the quarantine and the issues that are being constantly, that we're bombarded constantly every day on this uh, aspect. However, the reason we are here joining is to talk about a problem that is a cancer to our society. And it is the systemic racism that we are facing in the nation. And that is being exposed by COVID-19 and it has been exposed by technology and that is not going away. We have the Black Lives Movement, we have Latinos being united and trying to fight this from the roots. But are we doing enough? Are we talking about it enough? Are we actually doing and taking steps towards a solution? That is the goal today. And my goal as a journalist, as a moderator, is not just to get answers in regards to what's going on, but also what is being done in, in terms of everyone, not just the politicians or leaders, but us as a society. So I thank you for joining. The fact that you're here with us means that you care and that you want to be part of the solution. We have a great four subject matter experts on this topic. I'd like to welcome first, Mark Morial. He's one of the few national leaders to possess street smarts and the boardroom savvy. He's the current president and CEO of the National Urban League, the, nationals, the, nations, the nation's largest historic civil rights and urban advocacy organization. He also served mayor of New Orleans, as well as the president of the US Conference of Mayors. He previously was a Louisiana state senator and a lawyer in New Orleans with an active high profile practice. Mark, bienvenido. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you, muchas gracias. I'm honored to be here. Thank you very much. And a special thanks to the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute, uh, the sponsors and all of the co-panelists today. And great to be back with you. <laughs> Great to see you again, Mark. We have Trina Govan-Scott. She's the Chief Diversity Officer for Rock Ventures. This is a Detroit-based company serving the top 100 businesses that make up the Rock family of companies. Trina develops the strategy and infrastructure that fosters a culture of equity and inclusion by leveraging a diverse perspective of team members. She's passionate about people and creating a work environment that is grounded in collaboration and freedom of self-expression. Thank you, Trina, for joining us. Thank you, Tatiki, for having me. I'm really uh, looking forward to the conversation with all of the panelists, so really appreciate the opportunity to share and learn. Thank you. Now we have uh, NEA President Becky Pringle. Becky, she's a social justice warrior. I really love your bio, Becky. She's a defender of educator rights, an unrelenting advocate for all students and communities of color, and a valued and respected voice in the educational arena. A middle school science teacher with 31 years of classroom experience, she uses her intellect, her passion, and purpose to unite the members of the largest labor union with the entire nation and using the collective power to fulfill the promise of public education. Becky, gracias. Thank you for joining us. It is an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, our three million members of the largest labor union in this country, the National Education Association, are so proud uh, to not only be a sponsor of this conf conference, but to be a longtime partner of CHCI. It's good to be here. Great to have you, Becky. And we also have George Walker. 
George Walker joined Planned Parenthood as the Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in October 2018, ensuring that equity and inclusion are embedded in Planned Parenthood's organizational DNA. He's a professional inclusion leader and executive coach with a balanced background and also experience on related functions of advocacy. George, it's a pleasure to have you again. Thank you so much for joining us. Gracias a ustedes. Love the Spanish, by the way. Sí. So I did not <laughs> tell you. Uh, I did not tell you that a lot of the questions are going to be in Spanish and some of the answers too. So I'm, I'm hoping that you guys. <laughs> Look at Mark, he turned away right away. What's going on here? <laughs> we have a lot of questions, guys. I'm glad that I got your attention. The first one, and I, I like to uh, kind of put the road ahead to see where we're standing, where are we in this situation, and to see how we got here. And I'd like to start with you, Mark. What is your, your perspective on this subject that we're discussing today? Where are we right now? And well, why? this... Thank you very much. And uh, let me just say congratulations to Becky Pringle. Congratulations on uh, your presidency. We are so, so proud of you and look forward to continuing our work together. So thank you and congratulations mm -hmm. to you. Uh, 2020 is shaping up to be one of the most consequential years in modern American history. I think of it as four pandemics, the pandemic of COVID, the pandemic of the economic distress that COVID has caused, the pandemic of racial justice. And the fourth pandemic is a pandemic of the soul and the spirit mm. and the consciousness of America. And it strikes me that we have to correct, we have to heal, we have to address uh, the, if you will, pandemic of the soul and the spirit if the work to overcome racial injustice, if the work to rebuild our economy, if the work to get beyond COVID is gonna be sustainable uh, and indeed complete. We all know the long history of exclusion, excluding African-Americans, excluding uh, people of Latinx uh, descent, people who are Native American and American Indian, the locked out and the left out. But here's what we must remember. The locked out and the left out have survived. The locked out and the left out have thrived. The locked out and the left out have contributed mightily to this nation in terms of science and education and public leadership and labor leadership and business leadership uh, in, in terms of what we contribute to this nation each and every day. We're indispensable, uh, our communities are, to the future of America and a successful future for this nation. We're at a period now where those difficult conversations have to be had. We're at a period now where institutions, business institutions, government institutions, labor institutions, media institutions must change. If we talk about institutional racism, it lives within the institutions uh, I just mentioned. So we all must strive. We all must work. Uh, we all must understand that it, it, this is a problem that has long been here. Maybe some Americans are waking up uh, to the nature of this. And if that's so, that is good. But we must keep them awoke. We must remain awoke. And we must be, if you will, compelled in this time to not just be woke, but to act. I'm glad you brought that up, Mark. Um, are we saying that COVID-19 or technology has brought up this problem that I personally believe has been going on as a cancer for many, many years, and not just for the African-American, for the Latino community, when the, we didn't have the cell phones before, we didn't have ways to expose this brutality, this abuse or the racism, right now we do. What is your opinion on this, George? Do you think uh, the current circumstances of this cancer are being exposed just because of the circumstances that we face? Well, I think absolutely, thank you uh, for the question. It is an accelerant. It is always there. Um, this has been an accelerant. It has reminded us that uh, the fissures that existed are, are now coming to the surface. I think another thing that um, um, for most folks who are 
um, seeing all of this movement, seeing all of this, um, it's also within the context. COVID hits us as a health issue. Uh, black and brown people have been saying for years that there's disparity in health. And certainly at Planned Parenthood, one of the things we know as a health provider, um, that the health issue and the political issues are absolutely tied together. Um, and this, this season has meant that they are also um, something that is more exposed, as Mark mentioned earlier. I mean, we are the, the politics uh, of the country. Uh, I realize we're on a 501c3 panel and we won't be talking about parties or, or our particular um, uh, positions, but the politics of the country are, um, have also forced the, uh, the accelerant. So I don't think it's one thing or the other. I think it's a combustion of a lot of things that have come together and said, wait a minute, this, you know, time's up. We've, we've got to do something else. Um, now, yeah. Trina, you are a, a chief diversity officer for this great uh, group of companies. What would you say to us regarding the unique challenges that we face within our communities? And I'm talking minorities, all of us, that we face with the systemic racism that we're experiencing right now. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. I think what Mark said about sustainability and transformational change is super important. And uh, Detroit uh, being the city that we're housed in, uh, the most densely populated uh, city in the country of black and brown people, it is imperative that we ensure that the systematic changes that need to uh, be taken as a corporation that we're doing. Um, so we're not just making nice statements, we're actually putting the action behind the plan. And um, when we think about the city of Detroit, we think about the um, digital divide that exists. 30% uh, of Detroit households uh, don't have access to broadband. 22% uh, of Detroit households only have access to um, um, cellular um, access. And that is when we think about all of the things that have been happening uh, in terms of access to health care, in terms of access to career and job opportunities, terms of access to just information of what's happening in our communities, all of that is done uh, via, we're talking right now, via technology. And to think um, that these households don't have that is, um, is, is important for us to address it. So what we've done as a corporation um, and working with our civic leaders here and the community leaders here is to build those um, coalitions together so that we can collectively address these inequalities and holding ourselves as an organization accountable for what we can do. I mean, we're the largest mortgage lender in the country, and it's important that we ensure that for black indigenous people of color, BIPOC people, that we are making sure that we're intentional about the access and the effort to be able to become homeowners is um, our number one effort. Um, so we're leveraging our position to be able to impact those policies uh, to make changes that are sustainable uh, for the years to come. I'm glad you brought that up, Trina, because in the, la in the latest the panel that I was having regarding uh, farm workers, uh, that was the main point that I think our goal should be. It's not just talking about the new legislation or the new policies or the new mission or movements. How are things being implemented? How are we holding people accountable? How are we actually taking action towards a goal instead of just talking about it. And that is what I really want to gather today for everyone that is joining us. And as a matter of fact, I'd like to invite everyone that is with us today to talk about this subject. Ask questions. This is not an easy subject. This is not an easy topic. I understand. So let's ask the right questions. That way we can get the right answers towards the right goal. And the goal is actually to make changes. So I invite you to please on the Q&A um, write the questions that you think we should be asking our panelists today. Now, Becky, you're a warrior. You're someone that is in the front line to, to make changes happen. What do you think are the main challenges that we as minorities have in order to create changes within our own culture? What do you think the mistakes we're doing right now that are maybe being conducive to the situation we have? Let's talk about both sides of the coin, not just the injustices, but what are we doing to not prevent it? So you are, I could not agree with you more that it is in the question that we actually have the deeper, sometimes difficult conversations that will ultimately lead us to a collective solution. 
So a couple of things that I want to add on, because my, my fellow pan, panelists, Trina and George, and of course, Mark, and thank you, Mark, for the shout out. Um, mm -hmm. We have been steeped in this work for a very long time. But this is a, this is a different moment. Uh, in a lot of ways, it's a different moment. I think Mark laying out all of those pandemics. I don't think I've I don't think I've added all of those. But adding the soul to that, yes, absolutely. But this is a very different time. And what is is different to me is that because I've been doing this work for a minute, and what's different for me is seeing that people, regardless of whether they are in communities of color or white communities, are all able to actually say the words to affirmatively say that Black Lives Matter. That is a huge shift in a very short period of time. And the understanding behind that, because as people ask, well, why, why do we have to say Black Lives Matter? And we know what comes after that question. But we have to affirmatively say it so that all of our communities actually can work with each other so that we are allies and co-conspirators to actually achieve the racial justice that we're all aiming to achieve. What I think is different in this moment is that we're having all of these, these, these convergences and we're seeing that it's not a singular system. It actually is it's many systems that are compounding together and certainly in our space of education, we see this every day. We know that it's not only about education. Our students can't learn if they're hungry. They can't learn if they're d dealing with housing insecurity. They can't learn if they, don't, if they don't have adequate health care. We know all of those systems impact our students' ability to learn and achieve. But what the society is seeing, seeing is all of those systems interacting with each other. And when we have all of those systems interacting with each other and that powerful structural racism that is on full display right now, we can't look away. We can't deny it. And so this country is going through a reckoning. You know, um, so many people in this moment are saying, oh, the light is shining on institutional racism. Well, the light's been shining on it for a long time. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and some people even say, well, you know, for, uh, this is, uh, it, it, it's been for decades. No, it's been forever. It's been forever. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. this it's country, been... we had the poetry right, didn't we? We had the poetry right. We the people. We the people. The poetry said it was all of us. But we know that the implementation of our documents in this country never, ever meant all of us. And so we I'll built these the systems forever, forever, building on those to uh, compound that impact of institutional racism. I'll ask this question and it's not gonna be geared towards anyone specifically. So if you can just raise your hand and maybe, maybe answer it. What mistakes are we doing as minorities they to not get out of the systemic racism that we have? Hold on, we're gonna be on the show. Maybe. Anyone? <laughs> Are we doing um, any, I, any mistakes? I'll, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you. Let me, let me give a little bit of background on why. Yeah. So as a Latina, and I'm covering constantly the stories about Latinos getting arrested, about Latinos getting um, abused, maybe. maybe. They don't know their rights. They don't know the system. They're not assimilating. I can tell you we are doing a lot of mistakes. Mistakes by not assimilating the culture, by not learning the rights by not knowing what can be done and what cannot be done, or maybe even challenging certain things. I think we as Latinos and minorities, we do certain things the wrong way, and we're not getting out of that, in that, that uh, scale of racism. But as minorities, all of us, is there something that maybe we are not doing in order to project a more united front and create some change? That would be the question. That, that's yeah, the question. I yeah, I take, I take, I'll answer. I think there is more work that we have to do to create a more united front. And I think communities have to understand the long, uh, the long history. For example, uh, I think uh, we have to understand that uh, Latinos in Texas faced segregated facilities. Uh, there was a system of laws in uh, the southwestern part of the United States that segregated Latinos and did not allow them to 
participate and not allow them to go to movie theaters and uh, utilize water fountains and go to stores, uh, similar to the system of segregation that African Americans faced. Uh, I think we have to understand that when the National Urban looks, looks at the social and economic status of blacks and the social and economic status of uh, Latinos in the United States, uh, they're more similar uh, in terms of the uh, way in which uh, uh, we uh, benchmark against white Americans. We benchmark against white Americans uh, some 25 to 30 points behind. Latinos are almost as far behind as African Americans. So. We, we have to understand and we've got to work more closely together. One model and one example is within the Congress. Uh, the uh, members of Congress who are black, Latino, uh, and Asian Pacific Islander uh, have formed a, a loose confederation called the Tri-Caucus. Uh, and they work together on a number of issues. Uh, that does not mean that uh, there is universal agreement on every public policy issue, but we've got to, we've got to begin to recognize uh, that uh, the hopes that unite us should be greater than the fears that divide us as communities. We have work to do to learn, to understand uh, our history. What is so tragic about the United States is that history as it's taught to our kids and all kids, uh, for the most part, bypasses substantial parts of the contributions of black people uh, and brown people in this country. Uh, and we have to go back and we have to rewrite history books and we have to relearn for many people. They don't know because they've not haven't been taught uh, in formalized history. The culture was denied. Look at old television shows. You know, I like to look at old television shows uh, and, and, and old Westerns and old shows like that. And they show a stereotypic image uh, of, uh, of, 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 of Latinos and and, and Native Americans, uh, the same way in which many of these shows show stereotypic images of black people. And that was injected into the culture and the consciousness uh, of people in this nation. We have to re-undo that to recognize the contributions of everyone and also the inequities that exist, economic and socially. We have work to do uh, to build bridges. Uh, I'm proud of the relationship we have at the National Urban League with Unidos US. Uh, with LULAC, uh, the, the work we sometimes do with other leaders uh, of the Lat Latinx community and the Asian American community and the Native American Indi American Indian community. Uh, at the leadership level, we have to build bridges, not because we're going to agree on every single issue, because we must build bridges to be stronger. And I would add to that, if, if I may, that Part of this is also about systemically, I don't know that I would answer, answer the question, you know, what are we doing wrong? It's more, what can we do better or what can we do more right? And part, yep. you, the first question you asked, well, what are some of the things that we can be doing after this conversation? Shared language is a really important thing and shared language um, is not to suggest that it's only in English. Shared language is to suggest an understanding of the history and how the words work and what, are the, what has been put in place that has deliberately kept us apart. So for instance, one of the things I think about when I think of, um, you know, I started the conversation by uh, answering in Spanish because I was born in Panama um, and I would have uh, existed in the world as, um, as Panamanian, um, but for the fact that uh, I'm adopted. And so I was raised by African-Americans. I later lived in Ecuador and lived in South America. And I can tell you that my birth memory tells me that when I went back to South, uh, to South America as an adult, I knew that I knew the language. I mean, I had to learn it, but I knew I learned the, I knew I knew the language. I could be in conversations, I could hear things, and it reminded me of hope. And I share that because I think that in part, a lot of us know we know the language. And it may not necessarily be the, uh, the, uh, the language of, um, whether it's Spanish or English or French or, you know, pick whatever other language, but we know intuitively how we treat each other will matter more and bind us more when we understand each other's stories. Another thing you said, you know, uh, Mark picking up on a thought you had in terms of just culturally, how many of these things were put in place on purpose? You think about the Long Ranger. You know, I was, I was an adult when I learned uh, Kimosabe. Kimosabe was the, uh, uh, with the, um, it was Tonto who was stupid and Kimosabe. K 
Kimosabe, who was the Lone Ranger, right? He who knows more. And the one, you know, was literally what we were saying in those TV shows. It was the white guy who knew more. When you start teaching those kinds of things in ways that are so systemic, it's going to be really, really, really hard to just suddenly, you know, um, um, extract all of that. But the more we have these kinds of conversations, the more we have these types of partnerships, the more we understand some of the ways that our language is translating, the way we are moving quickly. Um, I think Becky uh, made the comment about Black Lives Matters. I mean, in 2016, only about four in 10 Americans would have said that made some sense to them. And now the number has changed. Um, so I do think that language evolves, movements evolve with them and how we take each other with these different words into the new uh, the new place helps us. And moves us Absolutely. Forward. I think you're talking, George, about united front, doing a yeah. message that is of unity. So we all have the same angle instead of spreading ourselves thin. And I think it's a great point. Uh, we're going to have to say goodbye to Mark Morial very soon. Mark, your last name, Morial. I always say it wrong. My apologies. <laughs> no, it's. Uh... So we would like to hear from you before you have to leave us, because uh, we're going to be going to talk about defunding the police and what other you know subject matters that are on the table. So yeah, I think when I hear the conversation about defunding, let, let's understand uh, if if I am in a local community, what does that mean? So what it really means is that. The, the policy of addressing urban problems with more policing, with more arrest, has not worked, has not worked. And that we need to reprioritize uh, funding in, um, in America's communities to more emphasis on youth jobs, more emphasis mm -hmm. to after school programs, more emphasis to more robust schools and more robust school facilities reading coaches, after school programs, robust extracurriculars. We need to invest in those things that are positive. They have been redlined. They've been underinvested in, in America's communities. Visit a suburban school in America. You see a beautiful band room. You see uh, a great football field. You see a gymnasium. You see great band uniforms. You see a school newspaper. You see after school activities. You go to an urban setting and you see none of the above in many of them. We've got to invest in, in our children and policing has to evolve and change. So, uh, and this is beginning to occur. Many communities uh, should not have police respond to homeless citizens and homeless people on the street. They should have crisis intervention units of social workers and psychologists the same goes for if there is a police role and one is detected as having a mental uh, situation. And officers who are trained are trained in the powers of observation to recognize a person who may be in some distress because of an emotional or mental situation and get some experts out to help deal with it as long as it's not a violent situation. I mean, we have to rethink. And I think many police have been called to respond to things that they're not trained to do because people's propensity is to call 911. And 911 is usually connected to either the police, the fire, or the emergency medical services. So we've got to understand what this really means in local communities across the nation. But we have to also acknowledge that in many communities we have a gun violence problem. Uh, and we need gun safety and we need to find ways to get the guns off the street. In many communities, we have a gang problem and we shouldn't deny the existence of a gang problem. And I want our communities to be free of gangs and free of violence. But uh, part of the part of the, the response has to be to provide meaningful, wholesome opportunities for young people and for children. I call it it's time to over invest in our youth double, triple, and quadruple the investment in our children. And I guarantee if we do it, if we do it, it will make a monumental difference. Great points. I, and I, 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 
fact that you mentioned the the fact that police has to evolve as we are all evolving. Trina, I am sorry. And and Mark, feel free to raise your hand when you have to leave so we can all say goodbye. Yeah, I got to leave, take another call. Thank you very much, you. everybody. Mark, Appreciate thank it. you so much for joining us today in this conversation. Trina, no, I didn't Tatiki, I was just going to build. No, I was going to build off of what Mark said in terms of providing opportunity. And uh, that's what I was trying to describe when I was talking about the digital divide here that we have in the city of Detroit. Being a native Detroiter, being a black woman here, um, it's, it's really been uh, important for us personally, for me personally, and for us as an organization to be able to address that in a meaningful way. So I think private and partner um, and privately and public partnerships are critical in doing that. Um, so, you know, talking about what the digital divide looks like in Detroit, but I, I just want to talk about the solution that we've come up with um, and working with our civic uh, leaders here, um, working with the community. So we're not making decisions for people who live in the community of what resources they do or don't need. And then working with, you know, our uh, school district uh, to make sure that we are thinking about not just perhaps giving devices to people, but all the other things that go around that. Um, giving the educational component of how to navigate with these devices, um, providing sustainable opportunities for people to go within a 10 minute walking distance to community hubs to access broadband until we are able to provide it for each household. Those are the kinds of things that I think if we think about how are the children and we think about what is our future, uh, we have to be able to address those things in a way where we're working as a collective uh, to be able to have solutions that are going to be transformative for families to be successful and to be able to bridge this gap that currently exists. And so I think that's so vital, um, especially when yeah. we think about opportunity. Absolutely. Great point, Trina. You actually expanded on, on, on uh, Mark saying, what are, we, what are we doing right now for future generations even? And that's one of the questions that we have from our audience. And I thank our audience for sending the questions. We have plenty of them, uh, but we hope that we're going to be you know, answering as many as we can. And I also want to invite everyone to keep tweeting Keep treating this uh, panel so keep people start asking the questions and getting the answers that we need. And before getting to that, um, I'd like to get uh, an answer from Becky. Becky, you're such a, a, a passionate about justice and everything. What do you think the, the future for the Black Lives Movement is going to be? Is this just a, a phase that we're living right now within this 2020 pandemic year? Or is this going to be fading in the future? Is there going to be a difference in your point of view? So I don't think it's a, fa a phase, uh, it, going back to what I said earlier, that it's very different now. Uh, you heard Mark say, and I agree, that people uh, not only are able to say those words affirmatively, but different communities like the Latino community are joining with us, like the API community, the uh, Native American community, all are holding those same signs because they understand that we must be in this together. I want to uh, tie that to the other conversation that we were having, um, and Trina, tie back to something you were saying too. Because when when you when you ask the question initially, what mistakes are we making? And I like George, you segueing to you know, let's talk about maybe some of the solutions because because absolutely where we are now is where is not where we need to be. So we're not doing all that we must do. But a couple of things that came up as I was listening to you all talk. One thing is what's clear, what's clear to us, certainly as educators, is we have got to ensure that we have ethnic studies in our, in, in our curriculum. We have to learn about each other. We need to know about each other's history and culture. We have to understand each other first so that we can build those relationships and we can work together to actually bring about a more just America. So I wanted to, to say that. And the second thing I wanted to say, tied, tied into something Trina was just sharing that's going on there in Detroit. I was thinking about this. One of the mistakes we make uh, as people of color I would say, and I'm not, I hesitate to call it a mistake, but but um, this has been allowed to be the language. I heard somebody say that before. Language matter. Words matter, especially when you're dealing with children. Words matter. And so when we speak of our communities, our black and brown communities, and we we talk about them from what I call a deficit model, then we take that on. And Elaborate our, on our that. kids. We take it on. So if we say, if we describe our communities as lacking, we don't have role models. 
we don't have uh, economic uh, ability uh, or, or wealth. We don't have uh, the educational quality. We, our schools are failing. Our kids are failing. Those kinds of words matter. And so when we look at our communities and we say that they um, are lacking something, then we don't mine them for the assets that they are. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because one of the solutions that we know works is when we come together and actually accept our shared responsibility to ensure that all of our students, not one, not some, but all of them, have access and opportunity and can be successful. And for that to happen, we have to surround that whole child with all of the services and support. So when you were talking about, Trina, those, those partnerships, absolutely. Everyone in the community has to have them and we can't go in and assume their needs. Absolutely. So I encourage folks to learn a little bit more about what we call community schools. And at the very, t at the very core of that is, is working with the community asking them, doing a needs assessment, asking them what they need, and then mining that entire community so that the school becomes a hub, but also the school is, is responsible for the success of the community. And our students see that their parents and their neighbors and the business owners not only care about them, but they have skills and talents and abilities people who look like them have uh, the, the opportunity to actually help them learn. And so we have to start thinking of our communities as the assets they are so that we can mm -hmm. surround our students with what they need so every one of them can be successful. So we can change the mentality from an early age and try to avoid exactly. any more problems future. Now, amigos, I'm going to ask you to keep answers from now on a little bit shorter. And the reason for that is because we have a lot of questions from our audience. And I know we're all passionate. I, I can speak for hours myself. If I could, oof, I will have a, a margarita and a coffee one side and then margarita on the other. <laughs> now we have to finish and talk about solutions. So we're going to go back to the questions from our audience today. And uh, one of them is very interesting. She says, Jessica, how do you... How do you think the current political climate is impacting young people's belief in American government and the American dream? And Becky, if I would, like, I would like you to answer this, since you're as, as a teacher, as an educator, do you think the political has an impact mentally on the brown and the black communities nowadays? I, I do. I talk to our educators all the time and our students. And by the way, I really appreciate the work that you do, that the CHDI does with our with our youth. That's so important. We have to create the space for them to be the leaders they are, right? Um, and so I get a chance to talk to them. And the, and and they they could be discouraged. You would think they would be, but they are not. They are actually ready to step into that space and be leaders in 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 this moment. We saw that with the March for Life, for March for Our Lives movement that continues to this day. And we see that right now in the political environment. The students know because our and our educators know in our schools every decision, every one that's made about our students and our classrooms our schools and our communities is a political one. And so they understand that they have to be involved in that process. Do you know that we have students who are running for school boards in their, in their areas? They understand that they are in positions of power to make decisions about the funding that those schools get. And so we're get, we, we are seeing them not turn away, but they're actually turning toward because they understand if the elected politicians do not care about whether or not they get what they need when they need it, then they're going to either run themselves or they're gonna make sure they have a candidate who does support public education and supports them having the services they need so they can live into their brilliance. And Becky, I just have to add to that, uh, you, you gotta vote. I mean, that's what we're all saying. We're using our <laughs> voice. When we talk about opportunity, you must, uh, you know, use your right to be able to um, impact change. And how do we do that? Well, we get, as we say here in Detroit with the Detroit NAACP branch, you get your soul to the pole. You have to get out and use uh, your voice to be able to impact change. Sorry, George, I didn't mean to jump in there. No, and no, I was okay. gonna, uh, <laughs> we're, um, I think we're, we're, we're vibing off each other and that's a good thing in this virtual <laughs> environment. The other piece of that is, 
you know, yes, for those who are old enough as young people to both 18 year old and older, but even younger than that, I think that there is a political consciousness of which um, uh, uh, young people have today uh, that is quite mm -hmm. different. Again, said it time and time again, the movement feels different. Um, you know, Black Lives Matter movement is the largest protest movement in the world. That's not just in the U.S. Um, you know, so I think that that connection to uh, to the energy uh, from young people and whether they can be politically active or not, they're starting it even within their, uh, their SGAs and their um, uh, student government association. So very early, they're active. Uh, the one caution I'd throw out, and I'd, I'd love to hear Becky say something about this as well, is that we can't assume that the education, uh, particularly where it regards uh, um, things that I, I would suspect that most of this uh, panel would agree upon in terms of the wholeness of people, being able to bring your authentic self, uh, even in young people, is always going to be on our side. Um, there are very concerted efforts for uh, folks to uh, teach people that um, um, equality, uh, gender expression, uh, other conversations about religion in, uh, in, uh, the, um, in, um, in education, um, you know, go down the line for all of those touch, touch button issues. Um, we can't just assume that all young people are going to be progressive on this. Um, and so we have to encourage young people to have these conversations, feel what they're feeling, understand where they are, um, listen to them and, uh, and be role models, frankly, for uh, the United Front that we want to see. Otherwise, what you have is young people who grow up to be old people who are resistant and who are not necessarily tolerant or uh, not necessarily uh, eager to share or to listen or to respect the views of women or to um, respect someone who um, has a different opinion than they do. Um, so I think it we, we have to not assume that just because people are young that they're necessarily, because they've been exposed to all the things that we've seen, um, that they're necessarily, that exposure is necessarily positive. We have seven more questions, guys. <laughs> so let's get ready to answer short and to the point. And this one is for you, Tina. It comes from Jaime. Jaime says, what actions can corporate America take to build a more equitable and just workplace and society? I'm so glad that, uh, that Jaime asked that question. Um, you know, what we've done here at the Rock family of companies, Quicken Loans, the brand you probably uh, recognize is that um, our CEO made a pledge with eight other CEOs here in the city of Detroit with the mayor. And, you know, it wasn't just words on paper. It was actually action behind it. And our action plan is focused on uh, recruiting. And we know that we need a concerted effort. There are 39 Hispanic facing institutions. There are over 100 HBCUs. There are um, predominantly white institutions that have black organizations on campus. We know that there's a wealth of talent that is out there. And I'm just talking about from a higher ed standpoint, but also for local community um, collaborations with municipalities here, uh, especially in the city of Detroit. So we know we needed to double down on our effort from a recruiting standpoint. Um, in addition to that, engagement is so important with your, your team members. We don't refer to our employees as uh, employees, but team members. So our engagement of our team members, listening to what's important to them, and then most importantly, aligning that back to the efforts that we have as an organization. And the third area is around leadership development. And so we're not just talking about how many people do we have that are BIPOC people who are in leadership, but the current makeup of our leadership team, how are you showing up every day? And how do we hold each other accountable for that introspective work that's so important so that as you know, Becky and George said, you understand how the decisions you make and how you set the tone for your team members make the difference of how the environment feels for those that are included or not. Um, the fourth area is around ensuring that we have more vital communication, both internally and externally. So we really appreciate the opportunity to be on platforms like this to talk about how we're holding ourselves accountable, but more importantly, to hear back from others of what they expect of us. Um, you know, you talked about law enforcement before, but we feel that it's important to have relationships with law enforcement. We're not trying to write the laws on that, but we are trying to support things that Mark talked about, more education for police uh, officers, more opportunities for uh, young people to see that as a viable career opportunity. I mean, I'm a Gen Xer, but, you know, I remember when I was in school being a teacher or being a police officer was one of those 
uh, or a firefighter, one of those career opportunities that you really wanted. So how do we have a chance to open up opportunities for, for us to police our own communities uh, through being able to join? Um, and then lastly, I think it's most important is our external partnerships and our ability to be able to influence policy. Um, those are the things that we're working on. And I think that organizations have a responsibility first to look within themselves to determine where they are, what is their culture, what do they influence outwardly into the community. And so us being the largest mortgage lender, how do we impact um, having people of color being able to be homeowners? What are the things that we can do to address that? And how can we address the issues related to policy that have kept people out of the ability to be able to own a home? And so those are the things that we're doing. We hope that others are also um, turning the lights on themselves um, and that we're working collectively as a business community to address these things so that when we look up 6, 12, 10, 12, you know, 15 years from now, things are much different. And so that's what we made our pledge to do, and that's the action behind our pledge and that's what some of our community partners here um, are helping us support support us with. But more importantly, that's what other businesses are also um, not just making the pledge, but making action behind that pledge. Trina, this is going to be a short answer from you because I just want you to elaborate on something that you mentioned within your answer. And it's part of the questions that we received. What does community policing mean from Araceli, from Araceli Pananeno? Since you mentioned it right now, I'd like you to elaborate briefly on that, please. When I'd say it one more time to Tiki. Community when, policy. What do you mean by that? Community politics? Mm -hmm. Policing. Well, I, I don't know. If, oh, policing. Okay. Um, I think that Thank it's you, important George. for. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, community you, politics. I don't know what that is. I'm sure you can help me out. Yes. Go ahead, Trina. Sorry. You know, I have to turn to just growing up in the west side of Detroit here. Uh, I remember having community centers, I remember having block clubs. I remember, you know, my grandparents and my parents being a part of uh, community policing, if you will, um, where, you know, if you did something, your neighbor said something um, and told your parents about that. We have to get back to how do we as a community um, hold ourselves up and hold ourselves accountable for the things that we can control. So when I say community um, policing and how do we work as a community collectively, those are the things that we're talking about as a corporation working with communities and working with not-for-profit organization and civic organizations is so important. One, that we listen to what the community is um, wanting and needing, and two, that we work collectively on addressing those things. And that's what I think makes um, a wholesome um, um, city. That's what I think makes a wholesome community, and that's what I mean by community policing. I love the policy that you look out for each other as a community and also as minorities. Now, George, this is an interesting question. Either you or Becky can answer it, but this is a very interesting one. It says uh, from Genevieve Romero. Thank you, Genevieve, for sending that question. How do we reconcile the need to dismantle systems of institutional racism and working within the systems that we have to achieve progress? Yeah. Would you uh, like to answer, listen. George? I'll start. Um, and one of the ways I'll start is actually just by talking about, uh, for instance, um, picking up on the theme of community policing. If you think about healthcare, which is where our business is, uh, if you think about promotores de salud, right? So you have health, uh, 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 health promoters within a community who actually understand the needs within the community. Um, the system is healthcare. The community needs actually says, look, within this system, here's what we need to do to make sure that we have grassroots folks who are actually educating each other about the particular needs or health needs uh, within that community. I mean, that's a very basic concept, but it's within a framework that we currently have. Now let's layer on to answer Genevieve, I think that was her name. Genevieve uh, Romero. Yep, yeah, uh, thank you, Genevieve. Um, answering her questions, I mean, we know that healthcare and the health disparities are um, absolutely, I mean, the disparities and the, and sort of the systematized way that um, black and brown bodies have been used, frankly, uh, for experimentation. When you go back to looking at the history of um, uh, gynecological research, um, you know, it is tied to racist policies within this country that um, said you could use black and brown bodies um, to, uh, to learn more about how we're gonna make health better for white folks. Um, I mean, that's very 
very sort of stark, but that's, candidly, that's how it worked. Um, I mean, we've certainly gotten better than that, right? But if you look at healthcare and healthcare systems, you have to work within the system. You have to have people who know, okay, what has happened historically? And then individually, how do they tell those stories and how are they able then to make a difference for the next, for the next system that's going to change? Um, I mean, it's intractable. And the idea that this panel or any other panel is going to suddenly figure out at the end of this, we can uh, shake our hands and say, okay, we figured we got the answer for racism, um, particularly in the U.S. Uh, it's a 400-year-old problem when you think about anti-Black racism in this country. Um, at the same time, it's every day we have an opportunity to make a difference, and we are remaking how this system um how the system shows up. Becky, I, I loved when you said, you know, we have the poetry, we the people. And while it didn't necessarily mean us, another piece of that poetry is, oh, say does that star spangled banner get wave over the land of the free and the home of the brave. And it's the only national anthem that ends in a question. So Becky, every day. Oh, go ahead, George. Yeah. I don't mean to interrupt. Every day, we have to answer that question. Is this true? And the way that we change the system is by answering the question and making sure that, yes, it is going to be true today, that we make a difference. Becky, what are your thoughts so, on this? So I do want to jump in that, Genevieve, that that's an example of the right questions to ask, right question yeah. to ask. Because if we are going to be part of that solution, then we have to look at ourselves within our own systems. So let me talk a little bit about the education system. I can tell you as president of the NEA, it is my, it is my vision that we will actually lead a movement to reclaim public education as a common good in this country, as the foundation of the democracy. But then we have, we have to transform it because we have to be very honest with ourselves. It was never designed. It was never designed to have that equitable access that we talk about. So we have to transform it into a racial and socially just and equitable system that is actually designed to ensure and prepare every student, everyone to succeed in a diverse and interdependent world. So we How have we to actually it? look, we have to look at ourselves. So let me, let me share this with you. Five years ago in 2015, 10,000 delegates to our national convention came together right after that horrific killing at a Mother Emanuel AME church in South Carolina happened. And we said that as, a, as an organization, we also are an institution. We have to look at ourselves and we have to take on institutional racism. So we committed, those 10,000 delegates committed the NEA to taking on institutional racism. What did that mean for us? We had to actually do the work to, to begin our journeys of awareness around racial and social justice. And then we had to build our capacity. We had to build those racial justice muscles. We had to learn, we had to get the language. We had to be able to talk about white supremacy culture. We had to be able to say it and talk about it and understand what it meant. We had to talk about implicit bias, including our own. We had to challenge ourselves so that we would, we would gain those restorative practices so that we were not contributing to the school to prison pipeline that so many of our black and brown, especially boys, but increasingly more and more girls are in. We had to challenge ourselves. And so we have been doing the, that kind of training for five years and it has positioned us now to actually lead in that movement, to be able to say the words, to actually center our work in race, and then understand how all of those systems are impacting to limit the, the uh, equality, the equity, the access, the opportunity for our black and brown students. And so we do have to take on our own, our own institution of education, and we have to challenge ourselves to be prepared to lead the way. Last question, and, and I, what I gather from all the comments that we've got today, including Mark, who, who left already, is that not only do we have to be responsible for ourselves as well, but also take action and try to create change with what we already have, not just for us, but for future generations. Now, going yeah. to the protests nationwide, even the violent acts that people assume they're part of the protests, what do we tell people that are not supporting the Black Lives Movement? What is our answer to these people that say, 
Well, it's not that important. And why do we say it is important in this what we are doing? Would you like to answer that, Trina? Well, I think it's important that uh, folks understand that we are focused on the black community because uh, this community has been, we have been marginalized for 400 years. We've been talking about it. Uh, I think this panel crystallized it and Mark talked about it as well. Um, I don't know if, if, if you can convince everybody that this is uh, the movement that you should be a part of. I think that we have to, uh, we have to continue to uplift uh, the Black Lives Movement, the Black Lives Matter um, um, position to be able to continue to address those things that are inequitable. And um, if folks are on board, that's great. And those that aren't, um, I don't think it's our job to try to convince folks. Um, that's my personal position. I think as an organization and as companies, um, we have to make sure that if we're trying to stay cutting edge, if we want to continue to get the best talent that we have, we must recognize that black lives do matter because we contribute to the bottom line and the success of organizations to the community writ large. So it's so important for us to recognize that uh, it's important to uplift and give a voice to all of our black team members, to the community mm -hmm. that we live in, um, and that we continue to work towards having a more unified and equitable access to things. I mean, that's what it boils down to. And so we have to influence those things that are making it inequitable and using platforms like Black Lives Matter is, is, is extremely important. As George said, it is a global movement. It is not just a U.S. movement. And so for those that don't understand the movement or the reasons behind it or are not on board, I spend my energy on those that are and making sure that those that are, that we use our collective voices for the impact of change that we know that is so necessary. So, you know, Becky talked about being able to um, really look internally first. That's what we have to do. We have to look within ourselves first um, in order to see how are we showing up and how are we impacting for good and not think about those things that are not impacting for good. And that's super important, at least from my perspective and from our company's perspective. We have five minutes for this panel, um, George, Becky, and Trina. So I'm going to be giving each one of you a minute, not not more than that. <laughs> we have to do it less, but it'll be a minute. <laughs> Just to give your final thoughts on this uh, session, which I find delightful. I find the fact that we brought different aspects to, to the table. And of course, we talked about solutions, but also responsibility on ourselves. So I'd like to, to start with you, George. You have uh, one minute, and I would like to thank also our audience for all the questions that we received. And I am sure that we answered most of them within the answers that you, we already gave to the other. Uh, primary questions. Go ahead, George. So I would just say, um, frankly, I think part of this is we can't teach people or even train people necessarily to be empathetic. That comes from experience. The more we know each other, the more we hear each other's stories, the more we get the common language that is so important. You know, whether Black Lives Matters is the language that resonates for you are uh, even all lives matters, which of course is, is, is offensive and it misses the point. It's still language that says, I have got to see you. And I can't say that you matter whether you're all or black or brown or whatever, if I don't see you, if I don't hear your story. And if we don't do more storytelling for each other and not making assumptions about what someone is just based on um, what we think we see, uh, we're not going to get to some of the real intrinsic changes that have to be made that truly do take courage, they take empathy, and they take wisdom to make a difference that's, uh, that's really going to make the change. Um, I could go on and on, but I'm, I'm over. Yeah, I know you can. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I, think, I think it's so true, Satiki. I'm just going to build off what George said and make it really, really, really quick. Um, you're right. It, it is about um, getting to know uh, each other. I think it's that simple. And Becky talked about it when she said, you know, understanding that we all show up with bias and how do we uh, start to build relationships uh, with individuals uh, so that we can understand perspectives and experiences that people bring to the table each and every day. And I think that's so important. It just gets down to that basic point. Um, you know, how do we show mutual common respect for individuals? And I think that when I think about my 11-year-old daughter, that's what we talk about with her all the time, that you have respect for people around you. 
and uh, making assumptions about people without getting to know them and vice versa is not the right way of building relationships so that you can have those meaningful conversations. And the point of I see you, I think, is so important, George. And that's what we've been doing as an organization, letting all of our team members, especially our black team members, uh, that know that we see them, that we see us. I'm a black team member. We see our team members, we see our community, and we're going to make sure that we have action behind the things that we can really impact for change. And that's what it's all about. Thank you, Trina. Becky. So I want to say, first of all, thank you to a CHCI for at demonstrating in this moment how we have to come together to have this panel in, at the CHCI conference where we're talking about Black Lives Matter. It says everything about the understanding that our that our movements have must come together, that what your issues are my issues and my issues are yours. And we have to fight together to solve them. I will leave you with this. There's no turning back. Mm -hmm. We will win because ours is a revolution of the mind and of the heart. Cesar Chavez was right. There's no turning back. In this moment, we have to stand up for our children. We have to pound on the Senate to pass the HEROES Act so our babies are safe. We have to vote. We have to not only vote, but we have to get everyone who likes us or loves us or intends to keep living with us to vote. We can't turn back. Because our babies, our babies are depending on us to be worthy of them. Thank you. Becky, Trina, George, enriching the conversation. Thank you. Very powerful words as well, solutions and angles to this conversation. Thank you for being with us today at the CHCI panel. Now, to all of you who have joined us, I really thank you as well. And not just for the fact that you are uh, listening to certain comments or aspects on equality, on racial um, equity as well, or even fighting racism. It's about unity. I think at the end of the day, when we bring these aspects to the table and talk about it, it's not even that easy. For me as a journalist, I'm constantly um, covering different stories that really impact me. I lose sleep uh, watching the videos that we get at the, in the newsroom or even hearing the stories from people, even blacks or Hispanics that are victims of police brutality. It brings the, the topic to the table in a very close manner to my heart. And I can assure you to a lot of the leaders that we are here. The fact that you joined today means that you wanna be part of this mission, that you want to be part of the solution. So after hearing everything that we had to hear from the leaders, Mark Morial, Trina Scott, Becky Pringle, George Walker, it's crucial that we take action, not just for us, for future generations, but also for the community all together, African-Americans, Latinos, whites, everyone in this. Thank you all. My name is Tatiki again. I wanna thank CHCI for having this panel discussions. And they're not only powerful, they're enriching and they can make a difference. Have a great day and continue with us. <laughs>